Hey, uh, so last week we talked about, um, uh, this, we would moved into Pergamum. Uh, Pergamos, it says here, but we, we would say Pergamum. And uh, we, so far we've talked about Ephesus, right? And like New York City to us. We talked about Smyrna, like Hollywood to us. We moved into Pergamum and I told you it was like the marrying between New Orleans and Las Vegas. It's really a vile place. And we paused because I showed you, oh, I guess I should pause this music. I paused because I told you guys, and I wanted to share with you last week about how America, we reflect the same culture that we're talking about. And so, um, had anybody saw that before, like at that level? Uh, all of the symbols and stuff? Um, it's literally everywhere if you see it, and we're actually gonna get into it a little bit more tonight. Uh, but tonight we're actually going to move into Pergamos and Pergamum. Uh, there'll be more coffee coming up, Noah. Uh, so if you have your notes there in front of you, uh, we're going to start there on page one. Last week we ended and I told you, I said we wasn't going to get through all the notes. And I said, that's okay. Um, the one thing I would allude to that we didn't get to is where it talks about wars and rumors of wars. Because there's people that say, well, that's always happened. Yeah. Not at the level we're at right now. Literally, I could pull up just headlines and I can show you like 30 pending situations right now. It's like um, that's going on between Russia and China and not just like them, but like them with multiple countries, uh, with America and multiple countries. And so that's the stuff you really got to start sharpening um, your spiritual senses to pay attention to um, as we're moving through this. Does anybody have any comments or questions so far? about class, maybe something God's speaking to you, maybe something you've been blessed by, maybe something you have a question on. Was it? Is there coffee in there? Yeah, it's like full. Oh, well, the pumper must have got left downstairs. <laughs> the pots were off, so tonight was in a hurry. <laughs> the machines was off because we lost electricity. Well, that'll be a quick fix. They can set that, set it in there for you. So, anybody have any questions or comments so far? All right, <laughs> that's that's pretty easy then. All right, well we'll move on. Uh, look, look in your notes here. Uh, Revelation two, uh, tw uh, twelve through seventeen. It says this. Uh, so, like I said tonight, we're gonna. If I can, are we on here? I don't know. Tonight we're going to be talking about this place, it's Pergamum, and when we get into these notes, I want you to picture in your mind this, Pergamum actually set on top of a hill, and so this would be in Western Asia Minor, it'd be in modern day Turkey. It, it was a city that set on a hill, and when you would approach this place, um, going back, remember what I taught you guys, There's an, like it was like the first interstate and it was going up through all of these places and it started here and it kind of worked its way around and came back in here. That was actually built with intent by the Romans and as we uh, get a little farther into some of these other churches, you're gonna see why because the back side of these churches was basically built for protection. These cities were protected. These were wealthy, incredibly wealthy cities uh, in Asia Minor, and these are not the only seven cities, I told you this, but these were the seven main players that we read about. And so, as you approached this city called Pergamum, it would have set like this, kind of up on a hill, and on the back side of this, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, there was this beautiful river. And the river that was on the back side was believed to be dedicated to two gods in Greek culture. Uh, and, but when you would have come in, you would have come in on this, this main road coming up to uh, Pergamum. And so this is where we're at tonight. It says to the angel, who's the angel? Pastor. All right, the pastor. Uh, that, that word in the Greek is like messenger. Uh, and it means uh, pastor in essence. Of the church of Pergamum, right? These are the words of him that has a sharp double-edged sword. And this is, we're going to start breaking down a lot of Greek on this verse tonight. Um, I know where you live. I told you before, that's kind of a blessing and like, yikes. I know where you live, he says, where Satan has his throne. 
John writes this, God reveals this to John twice in this one verse. And this is essential to this verse. We touched on this before. We're really going to dive into this a little bit tonight too. He says, yet you remain true to my name. You did not re renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas. We're going to talk about this guy tonight. He was an incredible, incredible individual. Um, remember I talked to you about when we was back in Smyrna about Polycarp? You find that each one of these cities had somebody that was just very important to seeing the kingdom go forth in that city. And so I would say this to you, God could write the same about you and your city today. Your name could be mentioned like that. And so he says, the days of Antipas, my faithful uh, witness, who was put to death in your city? And then he echoes it. He says, where Satan lives. And then I told you last week, I said, so when you would come up into Pergamum, the center, the pinnacle of the city, there was this giant altar, and it was called the altar of Zeus. And this was the most magnificent galt altar of the day. This altar was made of like... Uh, fine stone marble, and it would have been gilded or covered in gold. So go with me and picture this. When you're coming up to the city, remember what I taught you last week, there was a dark cloud that hovered over this city. And the reason there was a dark cloud that hovered over the city was because there was so many pagan temples throughout this whole city. I mean, they were literally everywhere. And they would be burning uh, sacrifices all day, and, and, and night, but this was, this was the showstopper there. And this was the only outdoor um, altar that was like this, that was in this form. And it was, it's, the picture does not do you justice to nearly how big this thing was. And so they would literally be having uh, sacrifices on this thing 24 hours a day. The smoke would go up and it would leave a cloud over the city, and the sun once in a while would pierce through the cloud, and it would hit this big, bright white uh, altar that had was covered in gold. And so you're coming into the city. Now just think about this, right? So when you come into who, who's who's ever been to Las Vegas? Anybody? You sinners. <laughs> Some people's like, I would never. It's a pretty impressive place. I've been there. Uh, who's ever been to New Orleans? Sinners. I've been to New Orleans too. It's not a pretty impressive place. It's filthy. Uh, but I would say this. When you come into these places, there are things that captivate you. The smells, the noise, the music, the lights. I remember the first time we went to Las Vegas. I say the first time like we go every year. I've been, I've been there twice, okay? And I was in high school you both there. times. <laughs> All right. Back in that day, yeah. major. <laughs> you didn't check them out very good, did you? Let me check my stocks. Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. Uh, but no, like whenever you go to these places, can I tell you, sin looks attractive. And so I remember the first time we had went to, to Vegas, it was my freshman year, and we went out there on vacation, and you're coming down out of the mountain, and you're coming down into the city, and the lights, and all of the entertainment, and it's like, this place is a mess. That's what it would have been like when you showed up at this place, because it wasn't really close to anything else. And it was like, when you came into this place, there's all of this stuff going on, and there's all these smells and there's all of the, the attraction and the noise and the entertainment. And, but it was an awfully dark, sinful place. And so uh, it would have kind of looked like this. Like as you come in, there's people all over the place. They're, they're all around these altars. There's all kinds of ungodly acts taking place near these altars because uh, the, these gods represented all different kinds of things. They represented sexual sin, financial sin, I mean, political sin, all the, the things you could think of was lit literally in this sin. And so this, this, this altar, when you come into the, from the road below, set 900 feet above the valley, but it would be like this beacon. It would be the first thing that you saw on the hillside. Now, I told, told you last week, the altar is no longer in, in this place where uh, Pergamum was, 
because during World War II, they started a museum in Berlin, and they moved, they got ships, and they moved this to the, the city of Berlin uh, to protect it because they, they valued this pagan altar so much because it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And he continues on, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam and Balak, and we'll get into that. Uh, in our next class just a little bit, to entice the Israelites to sin and ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. And I taught you who they were. They were the people of compromise, remember? This was huge in this city. But before we judge them, the reason it was huge in this city is because of what you'll learn tonight, what, this, what was in this city that they faced you know, it's so easy. Here's an example for us to look at somebody who is a, a famous preacher. I'll just throw them out there. And you judge them, but you've never been tempted by what they're tempted with at the level they're tempted with. It's not saying what they do is right or wrong. Or you could look at that as a movie star, or you could look at that as a politician. But if, if you're not on that level where you've seen what they've seen, you better be very careful what you say. And so these people the persecution they experienced was insane because of where they lived. It was called the seat of Satan for a reason. And he says, repent. This is an essential key part to all of the churches. This is a message God still speaks to his church. This is a message that all the awakenings and outpourings that we're beginning to see in America is being resurrected in churches. Is the message of repentance. And can I tell you, that is not a religious word. That is a kingdom word, and it means this. It means to change the way you think and change the way you act. That's what it means. It means to completely turn and go the opposite way. It, so emotion is not necessarily repentance. You can get really emotional and not be repentant. And so he says, repent, therefore, uh, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against, uh, and will fight against them with the sword of of my mouth. And he continues on. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will uh, give him some uh, hidden manna. That would be awesome. And I will give that person a white stone. I talked to you last week what that is. I'm not going to get back into it. If you want to know, just watch the last class. Go back to your last notes. A white stone with a new name written on it, known only by the one who receives it. Now, I'm going to show you like I talked to you last week a little bit about how paganism has invaded our culture. Um, so whenever I moved to Omaha, I saw this thing and it captivated me. This was called the Camp Cow. And it's made in Texas. They make these things in Texas. It's actually a company. I was like, this is the coolest grill I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you put your meat in here and as you light the fire inside of this thing, and this thing's massive. I mean, they're big. And they run from $950 here. You can buy big ones that go up to like two grand. But this thing was awesome. I saw this at, at a, a barbecue place out there. You put your meat in here. You put your coals and everything. You heat it up. And his eyes begin to glow red. And smoke rolls out his nostrils. I'm like, this thing was so cool. So that's, that's like one on a trailer. That's what it looks like with the fire built inside of it, right? And there's the smoke rolling out the nostrils. Until I read this, this story in Revelation. And he talks about this guy named Antipas who was in the city of Pergamum, who was killed for the sake of the gospel. And I was like, I wonder how he died. And he died by this thing called the brazen bull. And I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what the brazen bull is. Well, then I Googled it and this grill showed up. And I was like, well, that's weird. <laughs> because this grill is called the camp cow or the brazen bull. And I was like, well, that's weird. And so I looked it up and this is what it would look like in your Bible days. So they had a torture device in the Roman Empire literally called the brazen bull. And they would take a Christian and they would open the side they would stick them on the inside, lock the door. They would start a flame beneath the, the cow that looked just like this. And this is what they did to Antipas. And they burned him alive. And as he screamed, there was horns that would go through the bull as smoke's going out the nostrils, as the eyes are red. And as he's screaming, 
the, the, his screams would go into this horn instrument and it would sound like worship music coming out of this device. And the pagans would gather around this bull and they would celebrate at this sacrifice. And in America, we're like, that'd be a cool grill. And this is how pagan we've become as a society. I'm sitting over here going, what an awesome grill. And then I find out it's designed after a torture device that killed our own people. And so, so when you look at things, this is all throughout. How many of you have ever heard, if you don't know history, you're bound to repeat it, right? Like, that's what we do. And so... Uh, he continues on in Revelation. He says, I know where you live. That's essential. Because also in this day, you didn't always get to choose where you lived. And these people were placed, many of them, in this city. They didn't have a choice. They were there. And God is speaking to them. I know exactly where you're at. So if you're going through a tough time, can I tell you God knows where you're at? And if you're going through the best time of your life, God knows exactly where you're at. He says, I know where you live. And we're going to get into the word no in the Greek. He says, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith to me, not even in the days of Antipas. Antipas, that's the guy I was talking to you about, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city. He was burned in the brazen bull where Satan lives. So now I, I would tell you this, why this is all important to you is because your goal is not to collect notes. Your goal is to grow up as a Christian. Your, your goal should always be to mature. And this isn't the only things, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are seven areas that as I've, I've walked with the Lord, I've found that you have to be balanced in your life. Number one, you have to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. What that means is this, you, you should have communion with the Holy Spirit every day. When you pick your Bible up, you should ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his word to you. Remember when he talked about in Revelation, he'll give you hidden manna? That's what, partly what he's talking about there. He's saying, I will show you the mysteries of the kingdom. That's scripture. He'll show you things and let you avoid disasters and catastrophes that you never have to walk through because you're walking with him. Number two, you have to be continually led by the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between being filled and being led. Being led means, being filled means you're having communion, you're talking to him. Being led means you're doing what he tells you to do. Number three, you should always be praying in the Holy Spirit. Number four, you should be uh, having a spirit-led personal worship life. This isn't Sundays. This is you and Jesus by yourself. Because if you do it over here, it's not that hard to do over here. Can I tell you, prayer's the same way. If you pray over here and you're, you're passionate about your prayer life with God over here, it just comes out over here. Worship is the same way. If you're doing it over here, it just comes out over here. But it's hard to do it over here if you're not doing it in private over here. And so, but you have to have these things as you grow. And these are, these are principles that was taught even in the first church. Uh, now, I will say this. What you're doing tonight is important for your, your spiritual growth for this reason. So you have to study, not just read, but study the Word of God. You have to know these things. That way, when somebody brings something up and they, they start asking you questions, you can have intelligent, Bible-based conversation about things. And you know what you're talking about. Um, this is for your understanding and for others. Number six, you need a spirit. Um, you need to be spirit led in your witnessing. And what I, what I mean by that is, man, if you're not pouring out and everything is always about you, that's an unbalanced gospel majorly because this thing was not about you. The gospel is about the kingdom of God going forth and it never gets dull when you're, you're doing this with Jesus, when you're telling other people about him. And then number uh, seven, you need to learn how to rest and abide in God and know that he's enough. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, the late Kenneth Hagin, he said it this way, and this is in your notes, all spirit and you blow up, all word and you dry up, but when you balance the two together, you grow up. 
You have to have spirit and word. You need to marry those two things together in your heart and life. And then I just want to walk through these just real quick, and, and then we'll, we'll jump back into to Pergamum real quick. But you need to know this for where we're going, because this is how the first church was led. Number one, you need to be spirit-filled. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says this, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Here's my question to you tonight. Do you have daily fellowship with the Holy Spirit? And some people's like, what are you talking about? I mean this, if you talk to him and then you be quiet, he'll speak back to you. He'll show you things. He'll reveal things to you. Fellowship is the Greek word. Koinonia, and it, check this out. It means communication, participation, or to be extremely intimate. It's where we get the word intercourse from. We're all adults in here. That means this. You should be as close to Jesus as you could be to anyone ever on earth. Does that make sense? That's like no one in this room knows me like my wife knows me, except for Jesus. And I should be that I should be that intentional about my walk with Christ that I'm making that time with him. And so he says fellowship with him. John 16, 13 says, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, the, the scripture says of the Father, he will speak and he will tell you the things that are to come. How many of you would like to know what's coming? Yes. Dwell with fellowship with the Holy Spirit. He shows you things. Number two, you need to be led by the Spirit. I love this. Romans 8, 14 says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are his sons, and I would say daughters of God. When, you, when you're led by him, he says, you realize you're his family. You're, you're with him. You're walking with him. Galatians 5.16, this is a great one. It says, walk in the spirit and you will not lust after the things of the flesh. People ask me, they're like, how do you eliminate sin from your life? Here's, here's a biblical kingdom principle. Anything you feed grows, anything you starve dies. That's just reality. This is what fasting is about, right? Fasting is about you're getting closer to God and it's not about you're moving God. It's about you're moving yourself in alignment to God. And when you do that, uh, you're getting rid of something else in your life. You're sacrificing something else in your life. And it puts you in position with him. That's what it does. And so I, I, I would tell people this all the time. When they're struggling with something, how much do you feed that thing? Because that's a choice. That could be alcohol. That could be sexual sin. You name the sin, it could be whatever it is. That could be hobbies, uh, whatever that is. Number three, praying in the Holy Spirit. You should do this daily. And when I say praying in the Holy Spirit, there's praying in tongues and the Holy Spirit. Yes. And I, can I tell you, you need to do both. Mm -hmm. You need both of these in your life. And this is why. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You ever been weak? For we do, when we do not know what, how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groanings and deep words. And then Jude 20 says this, and there's a lot of people, they should really highlight and underline this verse in their Bible because they're running to everyone else looking for a, a word or they're running to everybody else to look for motivation. This is what Jude says, but beloved, building yourself in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Number four, you should have a personal worship life that is a spirit-led worship life. It says in Ephesians 5, 18 to 20, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is d dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks. Can I tell you, you can pray in, in tongues. You can also sing in tongues. Yep. Both are important in your life. The, the best worship time I have is when I'm by myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back up 
one number three, praying in the Holy Spirit. Yes. Praying in the Holy Spirit and there's praying in tongues. Can you kind of sure. go a little further on that? Yeah, that's, so here, here, here was what I mean by that. There's praying in tongues, and that's praying. That's one way we would say praying in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But there's also, there's religious people that pray without the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Let me tell you how that works. You ever been to a Catholic church? They're just rehearsed prayers. That's not praying in the Spirit. That's praying in tradition. That's not Spirit-led. That's led by the Spirit of tradition. We're not to be that. We're, we're to pray as the Spirit of God, just like Pastor said tonight. So what Pastor said tonight was Pastor was like, pray like this is your loved one. And then as we're praying, Pastor said to you tonight, he said, if God lays something on your heart, speak that out, pray that out. That's praying in the Spirit. You're Spirit-led praying. You're not, you're not just praying uh, a traditional prayer. You're, you're allowing God to speak to you, and then you're speaking that out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Good question. Thank you. Um, and then that's having wor uh, personal worship life. And then this, this next one, study the Word of God. This is how you grow. This is how you mature. This is what we're doing. That doesn't happen. None of these happen unless you're intentional about them. Can I tell you that? That's why what you're doing tonight is so important. You're studying, you're learning. There's things you're going to take away and walk away with that you didn't know before. And there's things that I'm learning as I, I'm teaching this. Like, I just learned probably never going to buy that cow barbecue grill, right? Like, <laughs> probably not a good idea. We're taking back your pastor appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> they got me a brazen bull for pastor's appreciation. That's terrible. You, you learn it. You learn things as you grow. It's, it's crazy the things that uh, we don't know that when you do know, you see everywhere. Yes. And so he says, study to show, in 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show the self uh, a workman that is approved, need, that needeth not be, to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Can I tell you, your goal is this. It should be. Your goal should be to rightly, rightly, correctly divide the word of truth. And there's no excuse in our generation for you not to be able to do that because you have every tool at your disposal, literally right here, if you want to use it. Um, just make for sure you know the source, all right? Uh, but rightly divide the word of truth. And then 2 Peter 3.15 says, you should always be able to give a defense for the hope that lies within you. If somebody comes to you and they ask you things and you don't know why you believe what you believe, you need to go know why you believe what you believe. You need to know where that comes from. And so, and then uh, number six, spirit-led witnessing. It says in Acts 1.8 that we will be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Um, and then Matthew 28, 26 to 20 is a great commission. That's where he's sending the disciples out. He says, and go make disciples. Christianity is boring. When you make it about yourself, but when you make it about the mission that Jesus sent you on, it's pretty exciting stuff. And so, and then number seven, and this is really hard for some people, abiding in Christ. And there's a whole, we could go into a whole class on this, but man, abiding. He says, abide in me and I in you as I am the branch, as, as the branch cannot bear fruit of its own of itself unless it abides in the vine. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me um, and I in him bears much fruit, but without me you can do nothing. So he's saying good luck with that. And, and can I tell you, abiding is tough. Abiding means you stay when you want to stay and you stay when you don't want to stay. Abiding means you you don't tell God what you're going to do. You allow God to tell you what you're going to do. And, I mean, I got convicted of this. I was on a walk last night, and uh, Pastor had sent us, uh, as a staff, he had sent us a podcast, and I listened to the podcast that he had sent. And then I went back, and I was listening to, as I was walking my dog, I was listening to another podcast by the same people. And the podcast was on abiding. And... I didn't select it. It was just the next one that came up. And this guy, he was speaking, and he said, 
He told the Lord after he got done ministering, he had, he had flown and he had had a terrible experience on a plane through turbulence. And he said, I will never do that again. And after service, his spiritual mom, which is Heidi Baker, she came to him and she said, is that really your place to tell God that you're never going to fly again? And she said, I didn't know dead people had that, that ability to do that. And he was under conviction of this. But it hit me because it was like, man, how many times in our own lives are we guilty of telling God, I will never do that again, or I'm going to do this to here. And we lay all of these plans out before God. But we don't stop and ask God, what is your plan? What are you calling us to do? So, <laughs> hey, he, let, let the Holy Spirit heal my stomach first, man. One thing at a time. Yes. You talk to Dr. Gutierrez. First John uh, 3.24 says this, Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him. Think about this. One of the things that can rob the presence of God in our lives is when we stop abiding the way that we're called to. So Pergamum. Pergamum was a great city, but it was a blatant pagan city. It was known as the city of compromise. And what, what I mean is the cities of this day was no different than the cities of our day. If you, if you mention Philadelphia, it's called the city of brotherly love. It, and, and you could go, if you mentioned Vegas, somebody said it earlier, it's called Sin City. Sin city. We have cities that, if you mention Los Angeles, it's the city of angels, right? Somebody's like, what? <laughs> but but there's cities that, that they have these phrases with them. These cities were no different. This was called the city of compromise. And it's kind of ironic and it's kind of funny because this was the head political city. This was like Washington, D.C. of the day as well. This was where all of their politics pretty much of Asia Minor took place was here. And it was known as the place of compromise. That kind of sounds familiar. Uh, the early church was under her... Uh, horrible, heinous persecution here because they were so close to the spotlight because the rules that were being made here, they would be enforced here first. So when we lived in um, Columbus, Ohio, I learned something I didn't know in the restaurant industry. That was the home of Wendy's. And uh, so whenever Wendy's was advertising something new they were going to take nationwide, they brought it to Columbus first. And so you would get to experience things at their Wendy's before it would go nationwide because they would check to see if it was going to work. That's how they did with politics here. They was like, hey, we have this new thought on persecution. Uh, so if they come out with the brazen bull, for example, let's try it here first. We need some volunteers for this. And so they would go capture some people. They would muster up something against them. And so this place was under uh, horrible persecution. Um, this city was believed to be built uh, roughly a thousand years before Christ. I mean, not at this level, but at the root level of what it was. And Pergamum was the seat of the Roman proconsul. And so if you need to know what the Roman proconsul was, it was the official ancient uh, seat of uh, the guy basically, and you can read the notes here, but the guy who had the authority, the governor over Asia Minor. And this was the guy who called the shots. He made the rules. He enforced the laws. Uh, he exercised those laws, and this was the guy you didn't, you didn't uh, cross. Uh, and so uh, this would be the place where um, when they decided they wanted to do something different in Rome, they would send it out to these different governors. And in Asia Minor, this was where their governor basically set over all of these other cities that was in Asia Minor. And uh, it set high on the hill. And it's near, near this river, and it's the, I, I, I always butcher this name, but it's like the Caucasus River, I think is how you pronounce it. And this is what it would look like pretty much in modern day if you really, really zoom back, because there's still all these uh, relics and artifacts and uh, architecture that they're, they're excavating out. But this river ran behind here, and there was, there was all kinds of mythology that went in with this river, and it dumps out into the... Uh, a, a, a GNC, which is well, well over here. Um, it's actually 15 miles away. Uh, 90 miles south of this was Ephesus. 60 miles south of this was Smyrna. 
Uh, 40 miles to the east would be Thyatira, which is where we're going to go next. And it was located on the, the western side of, of Asia Minor. It was known um, for its scholars and poets and sculptures and leather production. And people's like leather production. Well, think about it. There was a lot of sacrifices that went on there. And so they had a lot of opportunity where they would take different pieces that wasn't sacrificed and they would make a business out of that. It was known uh, for its paganism and its temples and its science, its philosophy, mathematics, and architecture. Um, and when you look at this place, you can even tell today that at one time this was magnificent. I mean, think about this. They was building this stuff with chisels. And it was this elaborate that is still held up over time where there's still pieces of this. And it was modeled after... Uh, Athens. And if you actually look at this city, they say that it actually far surpassed um, uh, Athens in, or Athens in Greece. It far surpassed, uh, yes, Athens in Greece. Uh, and it is, the, the architecture uh, is modeled after that, though, of what we see. And so it's, it's actually... Um, was considered a more beautiful city, and it actually had more uh, to offer people. However, a dark cloud hung over the city, um, and this was the theater that was in the side of the mountain when you would come up, and so you would see this as you're coming into the city, uh, and there would be people, they would have all kinds of uh, entertainment here that would echo down through the valley. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what you would see, that would be what, what's here, um, sculptures, and such stop right there pastor you can't see the size of those columns but when we were over there mm -hmm. it, in one section there were eight of us it took eight of us locking arms locking arms to go around those columns mm -hmm. one column one column wow that's incredible it was huge and to think they built that with a chisel yeah how they get and, it and there? the structure <laughs> that's an, uh, it's a big chisel yeah that that is a a incredible feat. Yeah. Uh, so in this time, in this place, like I said, there was an incredible cloud that would hang over the city as you was coming in. It was said to be the crown of the city, and that was uh, because of the altar of Zeus that was there and all the pagan altars. And so um, it would be taking place 24-7. Uh, the guy who ran this place for a long time was a governor who was Alexander the Great's right man, and he was... Um, commissioned and put there, and then he took uh, one of his head um, lieutenants and he placed him over this. And the reason you need to know this is because the guy that got per put there the second time, uh, he did this. He proclaimed himself king and he developed what was uh, called, uh, a lot of them called it the, the kingdom of Pergamum. Uh, and it was known as this for years, and they had six kings that served there, and after the sixth king, it was returned back to the Roman Empire, and that is when uh, paganism exploded. And that's when you see uh, the violence against Christians really take off, and that's the time of this church of Pergamum that we're talking about uh, in Asia Minor. And what uh, Carol was alluding to was the architecture uh, it's not only massive, but Carol could probably attest because she's been there. It's impressive. The detail in the architecture there, that it's still there today, is amazing. Uh, and I, I haven't been there, but the, just you can tell from the pictures, uh, I, I was just I, zooming in on this, and I was like, the detail that's, I mean, look at the columns. The detail that's in every single column on this thing was, was just absolutely Impressive, And it's in the midst of this dark place where God decides to build the church of Pergamum. And can I tell you, God always addresses the, 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 the thought of compromise with the word of repentance. And so when we want to compromise, he says repent. And that's what he's talking to even about this church because the weight that they were under, many people who had come to Christ and had given their lives uh, to the gospel were going backwards because they wanted uh, to stay safe. And there was the temptation uh, to accommodate 
their neighbors and the expectation of their culture. That sounds familiar. And so Christianity uh, at, in the city in the time that we're reading this was still fairly new, so it was very misunderstood. And so it'd be like you moving into uh, a region or a land that Christianity's never existed, and you're bringing that in, and your intent is good, uh, but it's misunderstood. And if you want to see a clear picture of what that looks like, there's a great movie on this. It's called The End of the Spear, and it's the story of the Elliots, who were missionaries, um, and the story of uh, how he was murdered, taking the gospel in, and his intent was pure, but he was killed for the cause of Christ, and then his wife ends up going back and staying there and taking the gospel to the people that kills her husband. And that's pretty much the persecution that these people were in. They were in a very, very dark place. John 1, 5 says this, The light shines through the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. This is a very powerful verse, and I would go back and piggyback off of something Beth said last week. We were talking about all these signs, remember, uh, that's going on in our culture today, and Beth said, how do people not see this? Because the darkness does not comprehend the light. Still today. Uh, and so... The word comprehend there means to seize, to grab hold of, to pull down, to tackle, to conquer, to master, or to put under one's power. Darkness is always at the mercy of light. You need to know that not only for the church here that we're talking about, but for your own personal life. Darkness is always at the mercy of light. When light shows up, darkness dissipates and has to leave. So let's go back to Revelation and we'll use the remainder of our time breaking this verse down. It says to the uh, to uh, uh, verse twelve to the angel of the church uh, of Pergamum, write these words uh, of him who has a two edge, uh, who has a sharp double edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, where you re uh, remain true to my name, and you did not renounce me. Not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful servant, which we already talked about, who was put to death in your city. Now, we talked uh, last week, and you guys went through this with me, what, what angel meant. And I remind you this week, God, God always respects the authority, uh, uh, the spiritual authority that he places in a place. He never bypasses spiritual authority that he has set, ever. And so... That is a kingdom principle from the beginning of the word still to today. And the word church here is an interesting word because we, we hear this word church, ecclesia, and we think of immediately, we think of it being a religious word, and it actually was not a religious word. It actually was a governmental word, and, and it meant one that was called and separated and, pre and prestigious, assembly, prestigious assembly, a prestigious assembly of distinguished citizens these are all government words. Citizens who's determined, who determined the laws. They debated public policy. They formulated new policies. They argued uh, and, and ruled judicial matters, and they elected the chief magistrates, and they decided who should be banished, a body of believers who has been called out, and this is where the church comes in, who's been called out, called for, selected, and assembled by God's representatives in every town, Every city, every state, every region, every nation, a body called to make decisions that affects the atmosphere of a region. This is why this is important, and this is why you need to know this, is because when he's talking here to these churches, this is the language he's using. But here it's even more significant, because remember what I told you, he's talking to them, and they're in a government city. They're in Springfield. And so they would understand very clearly back then, okay, I understand the first part of this. He's talking about a body who makes decisions, laws, enforces such laws. But then he takes it down another level here. And this is literally, when you look at it as the church, it's like, okay, I can see this is us. The second part, can I tell you, all this is us. Because the Bible is a book about a kingdom. And so your, your goal and your job as an ambassador of the kingdom is to enforce the laws and the policies and the regulations. You don't write the stuff. It's already written. Your job is to take and enforce that in the area God places you. 
That's your job. Your job is to go to every city, every town, every region, every state, wherever God puts you. Your job is to advance the kingdom there. It's not to run from the darkness. It's to take the light that's in you and invade the darkness with the light that the darkness would dissipate and break apart. That's your job. This is why when we pray at 6 o'clock, one, we challenge you to be here, but two, we challenge you not to be quiet. Because your job isn't to surrender to darkness. Your job is to invade darkness with light. Your job is to advance the kingdom and push it forward. And so you are called, and I put this in your notes, but to rule and reign. That's what you're made to do. You are made to rule and reign for Christ. And so Revelation continues on. He says, I know where you live. I told you. That's powerful because God is saying, and we're going to break down this word note. He's saying he knows, I know where you're at. I know what you're going through. I know this season is bad. He's saying to these people, and the word know is the Greek word, oida. And it means this, to perceive, understand, or to gain knowledge or personal perspective based on firsthand knowledge. God wasn't saying, I know what this church is going through because Pastor A.B. told me so. He was saying, I've been there. I've walked amongst you. I've saw the good. I've saw the bad. I've saw what you succeed at. I saw what you struggle with. I've saw every, I've saw you outside of the church building. I've saw you inside the church. I know who you are. That's what he's saying. And can I tell you, God knows you and God knows me as well on this same level. He's speaking specifically to three areas that he knew this church specifically was struggling with. Number one, he knew the demonic environment where they lived. He knew what they were up against. He knows what you're up against. If he calls you to do something, he knows what you're against. He knows the battles that you're going to face. And if he called you to do it, he'll carry that out. Number two, he knew the sword of the pro that they sat under. Now, this is powerful because the pro how this worked, okay, remember I said he called it the seat of Satan. It literally was. It wasn't just because of Zeus's throne there. It was also because the pro of Rome was there. And so these were the people who, if they said, we're going to kill Christians for this reason, that went out of the pro mouth, and then it was sent out to the rest of uh, Asia Minor in the Roman Empire. And so it was literally a seat that Satan had controlled for years and years and years that was not even threatened until this church comes in. But whenever it says uh, he understood the sword of the proconsul, the guy that was uh, the leader, the governor of the proconsul, he would sit uh, literally on a throne um, like a judge, and he would hold a sword. And as they were making laws or if they brought somebody to him and determined whether they lived or died, if he raised the sword, they lived. If he dropped the sword, they died. And, and that's how all of the laws of the king, if he raised the sword, it was a yes. If he dropped the sword, it was like, no, that's not good. And so he understood the persecution they were under. He understood the proconsul that was there that they were facing. And then he also understood the, the horrible situations that they would face just because of the pagans. But can I tell you, Hebrews 13, 8 says this. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God knows where you're at today, too. He knows what you're going through. But he continues in this verse and he says, I know, the word oida, right? He says, I know what? I know your, your works, he says to these churches. He says this to all of these churches. He talks to them about their works. What does that word works mean? This isn't in your notes. I just want you to listen. The word works means this. It means their deeds, their actions, and their activities. God was saying, I know everything that you do. And can I tell you, he's not impressed by what you do. He gave you the ability to do what you do. But he says, I know what you do. I know the good and I know the bad. And he, he, he goes on and he continues and he says, this is the place where Satan dwells, where he settles down. This picture is one who has settled into a house and feels completely at home there. And this verb indicates it is a continuous action. In other words, what he's saying, this was really powerful if you understand this, this city, what he was saying to the Christians, John is writing and he's, 
through the Holy Spirit, and he's saying, hey, God knows where you're at. He understands that you're at the seat of Satan. He understands that Satan has the legal right to do what he's doing because nobody in uh, the kingdom of God has stopped him up to this point. Can I tell you, he has legal authority in many places on earth. He has legal authority sometimes in our lives that we give him. And so there's things that we pray and we're like, God, take that away. And God's like, well, you got to get this out of your life because you're leaving a door open. Yeah. And I taught a class on that last year. And so you don't want to give the enemy legal authority because what he'll do is he will move in. He'll kick the door open. He'll put his feet up. And he never leaves without a fight, <laughs> especially in a place like this. If there's a territory that he has held for generations, he's not just walking out of that. You have to really battle and fight. But you have to also understand the authority that you possess and carry as a believer. And these believers made the ultimate sacrifice, many of them, so the gospel could continue to be pushed through Asia Minor. But he says the seat of Satan, and this is where I want to end our discussion tonight. Satan is the one who hates, accuses, slanders, conspires against. He is the adversary. This is the Greek word satanos. But it's interesting because it says his seat. And I laughed when I found out the definition of seat. Seat is the Greek word thronos. Thronos. It's where we get the word throne. And the definition says this. The, the earliest use of this word described a physical chair in, in some, someone's house. And it was sorely reserved or solely reserved um, for the head of the household, known as the man of the house. I was like, that's kind of interesting. So like today we would say it's your lazy boy, right? Uh, <laughs> in ancient times, the, the household uh, held a supreme rule or authority over that house. And it was supposed to be the man. And he was supposed to be over all domestic matters. He was supposed to be the one that had the final say in all business decisions and transactions that might affect his family. The man was supposed to lead. This is interesting. It was customary to refer to this man who was to lead his house as the Lord of his home, lowercase l. Lord means this, ruler. Ruler. Uh, or oh, I'm sorry, owner. And so he was the owner of his house. He was one who had his home in order. He sat in this seat uh, that was designated to him, his thronos, that was to represent his rank within his family. And it was considered completely inappropriate and disrespectful. Now, don't take this out of context, please. For anyone else in the house or that came in the house to sit in that seat. It was an undisputed uh, seat to the master of that house. It was a symbol of his authority. Now, don't go home and tell your kids they can't sit in your chair. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. If God says... Satan had a seat over this city. God was saying he had, God was saying, I recognize he has a seat, a position that he has set in and he's been entitled to for a long time. And so he was saying to this church, I know where you're at. I know Satan has literally come into this place. He's kicked his feet up and he's so respected Remember what I told you here, you did not sit in the seat of the guy of this day. You didn't just walk into his house. And you just didn't do that because they understood in that their culture, different levels of authority. So what God is saying here to this church, think about this. Satan's come in, he's kicked his feet up, he's ruling in the city, and he's saying protect his seat. Even to the fact that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, they take the altar of Zeus, the seat of Satan, and they're like, we've got to move that to protect it. Mm -hmm. And so they take it to Berlin to protect the seat of Satan. It's really interesting when you marry history with the Bible and you understand this is like a massive 
uh, view of what it would have looked like from the top of that altar of Zeus before it all got dismantled and moved. It's interesting when you understand the wording. God doesn't just put stuff in the Bible. Everything was put there by intent. And can I tell you, you can't take this out of context, okay? You don't go home, like I said, and be like, oh, that's my seat, get out of my seat. That's not what he's talking about at all. But there is something to be said about when a man is not doing his job and leading his home. And it invites things into the home it should not invite in there. And so one of the things that we see is this. We should always have the heart and intent to search ourselves and ask ourselves this. I mean, this is what I took away. God, am I sitting in your seat? Am I sitting in the place that you've called me to lead in? Am I doing what you've called me to do? Because we all have a seat. And our seat says something. All of us. Does that make sense? Questions, comments before we close out tonight? Annette, will you pray? Father, thank you for your truth that was shared and Lord, the truth of your word. Lord, I ask that you would deal with our hearts this week and that you would be the Lord of our life. And we would examine our hearts closely. And that if there is areas in our life that is not in complete surrender, that you would just show us. Father, you are gentle. And you will show us. Lord, thank you for the truth shared at the with the church at Pergamon. Lord, with all this stuff in today's culture. I just pray that you would grow our faith enough to the point that we wouldn't even shake at the point of persecution. We would continue to be your salt and your light to a generation that is dying and going to hell. We are your salt and light. Father, that we would always shine bright for you. Even in the midst of whatever persecution that happens. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.